Several people have sent this in. I don't know if you saw it, but it may be fun to go through this. Alan Blackstock on Twitter at Alan underscore Cheap Shot, a friend of mine, a friend of the show, did a thread entitled Hulk Hogan's Lies Over the Years. <laughs> did you see any of this? I, I well, I, I saw the the initial tweet, and, it fo- and I didn't follow the thread because I've heard many of the lies, but we can go over them here if you'd like. All right, well, here are some of them, and Alan does a good job researching these, so I'm sure these are all accurate. The wrestler director Darren Aronofsky offered him the lead role three times. Hogan claims he turned it down because he didn't deserve it. Aronofsky categorically denies that Hogan was ever considered for the role. <laughs> well, besides it, just the, the fucking hell. Can you see the the footage where he's working at the deli and he gets mad at the meat slicer and everything? There's a six foot eight fucking three hundred twenty five pound Hulk Hogan's working there. That wouldn't be distracting from the overall story of the the movie. Yeah, Hulk Hogan was an all state pitcher in high school, and he was scouted by both the New York Yankees and the Cincinnati Reds, but an what? injury prevented him from signing with either team. <laughs> Oh my god, yeah, the injury was when the 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 fucking scout that was looking at him went blind. Uh yeah, by the way, how much did he hate Randy Savage? So much that he made up a story about being scouted by the Cincinnati Reds. Yes. Who Randy Savage actually was and did play for the minor league affiliate of etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And right. so now I've never even heard that one. <laughs> it's a good one. I never heard that one either. Here's another one. Oh, this is an interesting one for you. Hulk Hogan claims he's the one who first noticed Kevin Owens' potential. What? Here's a quote. Well, I hate to brag about it, but I'm the first one to point the finger at Kevin Owens. (laughs) And then Alan uh, wrote, after a decade of solid work on the indies. (laughs) I I was about to say, I guarantee you, people were talking about Steen for good and bad before Hulk Hogan had ever heard of him. Hulk Hogan starred in the movies Mr. Nanny and Santa with Muscles. Hogan claims he rewrote both scripts entirely, only to have his writing credit stolen from him by the Dastardly Writers Guild. (laughs) I don't know that one either. I never heard that one. Oh, well, because we've never, you have never heard all of Hulk Hogan's lies unless you've heard every word that's ever come out of Hulk Hogan's mouth. Because it's a different one almost every time. So some of these, yes, are new and entertaining. Hulk Hogan says he used to fight pride fighters in the 70s. What? Pride fighting championship was founded in 1997. (laughs) There was no such thing as pride. There's no such thing as mixed martial arts. Hogan wasn't fighting anybody in the 70s except the guy that was overcharging him on his guitar strings. That was that was the whole deal about Hogan is that they were they weren't sure at the beginning because he was just a big guy that played in a band, right? He had the size, but he wasn't an athlete or didn't have any credentials at same like all the other guys they trained in Florida. The Steve Kern was, you know, was had an athletic amateur athletic background, all those guys. But he Hogan didn't. He was just big and played in a band, right? That's right. That's why they had to fuck with him. That's right. He was too busy playing baseball. How was he going to learn how to be a tough guy? Lord. Hulk Hogan claims he was the first to slam Andre the Giant, that Andre weighed 600 pounds when Hogan body slammed him, <laughs> and the lie that Andre died a few days after the slam. Hogan also claimed that he tore 18 muscles in his back slamming Andre. Are there 18 muscles in your back? I'm not sure. <laughs> he didn't He didn't care a goddamn thing slamming Andre, because as we've mentioned many times, Andre went up for him, because that was the original finish, and he didn't weigh 600 pounds. He was barely, a, what, over five at his death, and that was six years later. And uh, what else is wrong with that? And, and 18 million people, well, not 18 million, but a significant number of people were in the I slammed Andre club way before Hogan. That was probably, well, besides the fact before WrestleMania three in 1987, that was probably the last slam Andre may have ever taken. No, 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 no. Did he? Did Ultimate he, warrior got him a whole bunch of times. Ultimate. Okay. And those 32nd matches or whatever the fuck, but 
point is that wasn't even the first time that Hogan had slammed Andre. Hogan slammed Andre in their 1980 run when Hogan was heel and Andre was babyface. And Kamala slammed Andre and Kinect slammed Andre and Harley Race slammed Andre and who the, I mean, we can, Anoki, we can, there are the clips. We have gone down the list before. Whoever want, Andre wanted to slam him got to slam him. Anybody he didn't want to slam him didn't get to slam him. According to the Hulkster, he partied with John Belushi after WrestleMania II in 1986. John Belushi said he died in 1982. I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> he has no shame. He just says anything. He said, and because you know why? Because two WrestleMania II was in New York, Chicago, and L.A. Yeah, and he could put himself in either Chicago or L.A. and both would be people say, "Oh, Belushi would have been there, even New York or whatever." Even New York, that's right. Except that. Poor John had been dead for four years at that point. Hulk Hogan, and there's a clip here of Hulk Hogan wrestling The Undertaker. Hulk Hogan told The Undertaker that he had caused permanent damage to his neck by botching the Tombstone pile driver. The Undertaker believed him for the better part of two years before finally seeing, before finally seeing a tape of the match, which clearly showed Hogan's head came nowhere near the chair. <laughs> Never touched <laughs> No, but the, he wanted – see, that's another thing. Hogan was very smart. He learned all the old tricks, make the young guys that are coming up feel in some way indebted to you or that they should be apologetic to you or deferential to you or you've got something over, well, you, you hurt me, kid, but, you know, it's okay. That's the business. And then they would be more inclined to do something for him in the future to make up for – what they didn't do him to do to him to begin with. Hulk Rules, an album released by Hulk Hogan and the Wrestling Boot Band. <laughs> There's a picture of it here. One of the most yes. famous tracks from the album is the tribute song Hulkster in Heaven. According to Hogan, he met a very ill Make-A-Wish kid in England and got him a ticket to SummerSlam at Wembley Stadium to watch him wrestle in the main event. Hogan wasn't at SummerSlam. He wasn't in the UK at the time. <laughs> so now he's making up Make-A-Wish stories. <sighs> Hulk Hogan claimed that he was asked to join a startup company known as UFC. While UFC wasn't nearly as popular <laughs> as it is today, Hogan said he wouldn't have joined because, quote, guys got beat up when the fight should be stopped. While in WCW, Hogan said a pay-per-view bout between himself and Mike Tyson was supposed to commence. Hogan's excuse as to why it didn't happen? Tyson was too scared. <laughs> Hulk Hogan. And obviously, well, wait a minute. I was about to say, neither one of those two things ever remotely occurred. And the UFC, so Hogan was going to leave Vince in 1993 and instead of going to WCW he was going to just say well, I'll just after 15 years in wrestling I'll just be an ultimate fighter it's the dream match we never got Hulk Hogan versus Royce Race oh, wait, Royce. Hulk Hogan versus Royce Gracie or Royce Racy or Royce Racy <laughs> Royce, Ra Royce <laughs> Racy versus Hulk Hogan would have been a main event any <laughs> 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 All right, well, let's get back to this man's lies. Hulk Hogan claimed on an episode of Hogan Knows Best that the reason he didn't get the offer for the George Foreman grill was because he was out picking up the kids from school. Yeah. That's not the way business works, folks. That's not the way it works. Hulk Hogan did claim that back in his heyday, he wrestled in 400 days in one year. <laughs> Hogan, yeah, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. Hogan claimed that since he traveled so frequently between the United States and Japan, the time difference made the 400 days a possibility. I never saw that one before. You didn't oh know my that's God. the one I always bring up. You never saw that one? <laughs> I never, ever saw that one before. No, that's the greatest thing because obviously there, in, in, there is some small germ of truth in the concept of part of this in that because of the international dateline and the time of the trip, when you fly to Japan, 
you arrive, I can't remember which way it is, but you either arrive a day later or a day early. You know what I'm saying. When you because you fly across the international date line, so you either arrive the day later than you than you should have, you've skipped a day or you've made up a day. But the point is, what he's trying to say is that he was working four hundred days in one year, not four hundred times, but four hundred days in one year, because he would fly back from Japan across the international date line and wrestle twice on a Tuesday. Ignoring the fact <laughs> that if you were then to go the other way, you would lose the day that you just picked up. So it's not mathematically possible anyway. So, yes, that's my favorite. Like he's Superman flying around the world at the equator to reverse the spin of the earth and turn back time. Well, maybe he did that in this one, too. In Hulk Hogan's autobiography, he made the claim that Elvis was a huge Hulk Hogan fan <laughs> before Hogan joined the WWF. He did work in Memphis. <laughs> However, <laughs> Elvis died in 1977. Yes. Elvis died before Terry Bollea ever got a wrestling lesson. So Elvis was not a fan of Hulk Hogan because there was no such person. And Elvis was a wrestling fan, and we've documented that. And he he used to love to sneak in the Ellis Auditorium and watch Cora Combs' matches because she was quite a looker back in the late 50s. But if Elvis was ever going to have a wrestling match, it would have been with Jerry Lawler for a shoot because they were in Memphis and everybody knew everybody, and that didn't happen either. So I mean, that, that, let me stop this list for a second. Do you think that's where it comes from? Like, he hears the genesis of a story. He hears something that was real. He's in yes. Memphis, and he hears, oh, when he was alive, Elvis used to always watch wrestling. We knew that. And then he just puts himself in the story? Yeah. He puts himself in, in the story as he sees fit. Hulk Hogan claims that both Metallica and the Rolling Stones wanted him as their bass player. <laughs> Metallica member Lars Ulrich apparently came to Hogan himself to ask him to play with the group. Lars Ulrich's comments were, what? <laughs> Hulk Hogan claimed he had been offered and turned down a so-called Legends match at WrestleMania 22. The alleged match, Hulk Hogan versus Greg Valentine. They were never going to do that as a Legends match at a WrestleMania. No, no. And what, what 22 was what? that uh, 17 was in Houston, 2001. So 22 was... Uh, 20 was New York, 21 was LA. I forget what 22 would have been. But about 2006. Yeah. No, that wasn't going to happen. You think, was he just trying to be nice to Greg that day? Was Greg uh, on site when he was doing that interview? It is just so interesting how he just seems to say anything. He claimed he was blacklisted from Hollywood because he turned down a gay producer's advances in the 1980s. What? <sighs> he came up with the idea for the NWO, but he wanted it to be him, the booty man, and the nasty boys. <laughs> now that <laughs> I do believe that. If you had Brian Blair on there, I really believe it. Yes, I believe that one. Uh, and that would have just that would have been just just swell. This is an interesting twist on a story you probably have heard. He claimed that Harley Race came into the arena with a gun in Kansas City in the eighties and set the ring on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and then when he ran into Hogan, he shook his hand, thanked him for all he had done for wrestling, and asked for a job. What? That is, that is the most extraordinary fucking story. He set the ring on fire. He set the ring on fire and then thanked Hogan and asked him for a job. With the company whose ring he had just burned. Is the ring burning in the background while he's talking to Hogan? Do you think if I get him another ring or maybe even just a garden hose, will they hire me? What the? Okay, let's dissect that for a second. Would <laughs> Harley did go in Harley was part owner of the Kansas City Territory. And St. Louis eventually. And, and St. Louis and Kansas City at that yeah. point, the Central States Territory. And the first time that Vince came in, Harley did go there, did he not? And Harley was not happy, was he not? And Harley, I'm sure, if he was on the premises, had a gun somewhere with him. 
So those things have been documented and are probably pretty true. Yes. Was Hogan even there? He may have been because, you know, again. It was the first expansion. It was 86. Yeah. Okay. He and it was, was St. Louis, which the was a big park. city for them. Obviously, Harley didn't go out in the arena in front of the people and set the ring on fire. That would have been Harley may thing. have. Oh my God. Have, Can you imagine a wrestler just, oh, wait, hey, that's Harley Race. What's he doing? Oh my God. He's setting the ring on fire. So <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, oh he's God. unhappy. <laughs> he must be looking for a job. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's obviously trying to get on here. That worked the last time when we were in Peoria and Paul Christie set the ring on fire. And then we went to Indianapolis and Bruiser set the ring on fire. It was Angelo Poffo in Peoria that set the ring off. But anyway, so Harley did go and there was something, there was an altercation backstage, but Hulk Hogan is never mentioned as being a part of it. It wasn't Harley just letting people know what he thought of the whole thing and how they were running his town and everybody was pretty much letting him say whatever the fuck he was going to say so he'd leave. Is the, is the way I kind of remember it. Harley showing up with a gun is part of what I remember, but Harley carried a gun everywhere. Yeah. There was nothing about lighting the ring on fire. He would go there in a couple of years and he would work with Hogan, but I don't. if Harley Race was alive, I don't Hogan. know if, he <laughs> if this story would be out there. Well, also, Harley Race would not have asked Hulk Hogan for a job. Harley, Harley Race would have gone to Vince McMahon since Vince had tried to fucking bribe him just a few years earlier to fuck the whole NWA before the first Starcade. They had that kind of relationship. But maybe, maybe that's because that's when Harley told him, no, fuck off, I'm not going to do it. Vince tried to leg dive him in the restaurant, right? That story's been in told. the bathroom of the restaurant. In the bathroom of the restaurant. I apologize. You can't just leg dive somebody right out in the restaurant. You got to go in the bathroom first. It is an interesting timeline. Vince offers Harley a bunch of money to jump as NWA champion right before Starcade. Harley says no. They get into the fight in the bathroom. Vince, from all accounts, does not come out of it very well, which must have been hysterical when Linda had to go get him. Yeah. <laughs> And then months later, Harley shows up backstage at a show with a gun, unhappy, and everyone knows it's his territory. And then, of course, a year and a half later, he went to work there. That was the wrestling business back then. And, well, and then they made him the king of the ring, King Harley Race, and then they booked him in Tennessee, and Lawler sued. Because <laughs> you can't be the king in Tennessee, because Lawler's got that wrapped up. And Lawler won the lawsuit because of his... 15 years of previously using the king in the state of Tennessee, so Harley Race could not be billed as the king. But see, Lawler didn't show up with a gun when they came in his territory. He showed up with a writ of habeas corpus, corpus delecti, and corpus Christi, and went the legal route. Well, because WWE were advertising on shows nothing about the Harley king of Race, wrestling. the king yeah. of wrestling, and who would yeah. that be? So Lawler won that. Here, let's get back to some Hogan stories. Here's a whopper. He sat next to Kerry Von Erich on a flight to Japan 72 hours before Kerry killed himself. Uh, no, he didn't. Nope. No, he didn't. Because, oh God, you tell him. I mean, in a number of ways. First of all, Kerry wasn't leaving the country at all based on his current situation at that point. Let alone he hadn't been in Japan in a while. Hogan wasn't going to Japan either. He was no longer in the WWF. No. Hulk Hogan also claimed he was the wrestler responsible for the WWF first selling merchandise. He had to talk Vince into it. I mean, that could be proved false so easily. Oh my God, that, that the first issue of the WWF magazine with superstar Billy Graham on the cover from 1978 that I've got must be rare because it was never circulated then, apparently. Well, that's a long time ago. How about all those t-shirts they were advertising in 1983? Yeah. <laughs> Hulk Hogan claims he was banned from David Letterman because he stopped Letterman from hitting on Linda Hogan. Hogan has appeared on oh. Letterman many times. <laughs> so that's not true either. Yeah, and, and, and Letterman has never appeared on Linda Hogan. Hulk Hogan says he used to be 6'9", but now after back and knee surgeries, he's only 6'4". Oh, for fuck's sake. Hulk Hogan, I hate the laugh. I get he, you know what the problem was? He had the the disease that affected uh, uh, Cotton Hill, 
when he, he was blown up by a landmine in World War II and it they had to take his shins off. This one I hate to laugh about, but it's, I think, been proven to be ridiculous. Hulk Hogan says he was going to commit suicide, literally had the gun in his hand pointed at his head when he got a call from Layla Ali that he took as a sign that he should keep trying to live. A, yes, lot, that, a lot of people have called bullshit on that one. That has that has been debunked, I think, including by Layla Ali. <laughs> yeah, I think by Layla Ali. He said, oh, that wrestler guy? One day he's going to get confused and go, I was going to do it, and then I got a phone call from the George Foreman grill people, and I decided to talk to them. <laughs> but I missed the call and shot myself in the head. It was terrible. Speaking of shot, Hulk Hogan claims that Vern Gagne got Nick Bockwinkle to shoot on him during one of their AWA title matches, but Hogan shot back and won the fight. <laughs> Here's one that's true, actually. Wait, wait a minute. Hold on now. Let's just not skip over that. Number one, Nick Bockwinkle wouldn't have shot on anybody. If you'd have told Nick Bockwinkle, who was a not only a great professional and what a worker and an intelligent, marvelous human being, if you'd have told him that there was some drama going into the goddamn match and that he might have to protect himself, then he would have probably said, well, Vern, I... I guess you're going to have to find somebody to replace me that can handle that then, because I'm not going to be doing it. And Nick wouldn't have ever tried to shoot on anybody. He never got beat up by Hulk Hogan. And if wrestling was concerned, Nick probably could have tied Hogan up, but he would have been the person to, to go into the ring under those circumstances and do anything like that with anybody. It's completely ridiculous. Well, this one actually may be true. He said he wanted to drop the title to Pipe. Well, that part wouldn't be, but he said he wanted to drop the title to Piper in 1985, but he didn't think Piper would be willing to lose it back to him. That part's true. Yeah, he wasn't willing to drop it, but he knew that if he did, that Piper would never drop it back to him. <laughs> That's exactly right. Uh, just a couple more here. He wanted to turn heel on the Ultimate Warrior at WrestleMania VI, but Vince wouldn't go for it. Oh, fuck. No way. He was about to put out his movies. He didn't want to be yeah. a heel. Made no, no sense. Tatsumi Fujinami tried to shoot on him in Japan God. and steal the WWF title, but the Hulkster beat him. Oh, seriously? Fucking hell. Okay, I guarantee you, sometimes when you're talking about shooting and shoots, as we've said, you know, there's always a wild card going on, but no, Tatsumi Fujinami, who probably, if Antonio Noki had said to him, Fujinami-san, you must shoot tonight for the honor of New Japan. He would have gone in there and fucking stuck Hulk Hogan's toes in his ears and probably not taken too long to do it, but no, that never happened either. Of course, there's right here the Arsenio Hall clip where he says, well, the beginning of it is, the things that I am not, I am not a steroid abuser and I do not use steroids. And then he goes on to explain how he used it, I think, three times in his life under doctor <laughs> supervision. Hey, I got, this sounds like a, there was a guy, I, I won't mention his name, poor fella, but there was a guy that worked in Ohio Valley Wrestling. He was here when, when I got here, he was one of the original guys that Danny and Trailer Park Trash and those guys had trained to rip and, and he was a nice enough guy, but it was, he had a kind of a, just an old time goofy gimmick and I changed it around and I gave him a different gimmick and put him in with a heel group and kind of fit for a while his work wasn't the best but it was a personality thing but then his real job was he's driving a school bus and i'm looking here at the four o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon tv news one day and i'll be a son of a bitch if they didn't have this guy on the news they had arrested him for drunk driving of a school bus oh my god <laughs> and apparently he took the little kitties to school that morning and then he didn't have anything to do till they got out of school so he went to a bowling alley and he had a number of drinks at that bowling alley and then he fucking went got back in the bus and went and got to picked up the kids and took them home but he had a a clear defense for this and actually it's something you wouldn't even have needed a lawyer like Stephen P. New to get him out of this because he clearly explained to the people how he was not under any circumstances drinking and driving he said i drank and then i drove i wasn't <laughs> drinking <and> dri <laughs> what an idiot 
<laughs> but it was, hey, it, it, it was a great explanation. I was not drinking and driving. I drank and then I drove. Hey, he had us there. Well, to wrap this up, Jim, final thoughts on Hulk Hogan's many lies. These are only some of them here that we're sharing. Again, this is from Alan underscore cheap shot on Twitter. Follow him. He has good stuff. The big list of Hulk Hogan lies. What are your thoughts? Well, it's certainly not complete by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. Not a complete list, but right there, a, a, a good a good cross section of the various fibs, lies, falsehoods, prevarications, and outright bullshittery has been emanated by by Hulk Hogan. As I've mentioned many times, I've said this about Paul Heyman. I'll say the same thing about Hulk Hogan. I wouldn't believe him if his tongue was notarized. I believe Heyman before I believed Hogan. Actually, and the thing is, even when Paul lies, the story is so good and has so few holes in it that you will buy it on the face of it because you can't see through it. Well, Jim, before we wrap things up and get a song or two, some sad news here at the end of the show I want to mention. News just uh -oh. coming in. Norm MacDonald, the comedian and Saturday Night Live alum, dies at the age of 61. What? He's been battling cancer for the last several years, but kept it private. Wow, I had no idea. I don't think anyone did. He's been a longtime favorite of mine. His talk show appearances, Dirty Work, has always been a movie that I get a kick out of, and I've always been a big Norm MacDonald fan. Very, very sad to see this. I didn't know he was, he's a year older than me. I didn't know he was as old as me. He, he, I was famous before him, I thought. You were. Well, well, see, but finally he caught up and 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 submerged past me. Well, that's that's sad. And and again, it's especially sad because here's a fucking guy the same age as me dying all of a sudden. Oh, it's not about you. It's about Norm. Well, it's about Norm being the same age as me. He's older than you. Just barely. You're still a kid. I'm just a young pup, a whippersnapper. Well, very Sna sad. This is your show, Snap the Whip. This I'm is. sorry let's, about Norm. I apologize. Snap the Whip.